All right, hi everybody. So we are on chapter six. This one's called Maddox. Um, a couple days ago, we read a chapter called Journal of Secrets and told them to drink the milk that Dale puts out uh, and basically literally open their eyes to a whole new world. Once you drink the milk, you can see all of the magical creatures, but that opens up the gateway for them to also interact with you. Um, so this Fable Haven, the place where Grandpa Sorensen and Grandma Sorensen live, uh, is actually a pretty dangerous preserve full of magical creatures. So we're going to kind of get into a little bit more. Um, from here on out, they know this secret, so got some good stuff coming up. So chapter six, Maddox. All right. Kendra snapped awake with her sheets tented over her head. She was supposed to be excited about something. It felt like Christmas morning, or a day she was going to take off school so her family could visit an, amuse an amusement park. No, she was at Grandpa Sorensen's. The fairies! She pushed off the sheets. Seth lay in a contorted position, hair wildly disheveled, mouth open, legs tangled in his covers, still out cold. They had stayed up late discussing the events of the, events of the day, almost like friends rather than siblings. Kendra rolled out of bed and padded over to the window. The sun was peeking over the eastern horizon, streaming um, gilded highlights across the treetops. She grabbed some clothes, went down to the bathroom, took off her nightshirt and dre got dressed for the day. Make sure you can see that. All right. Downstairs, the kitchen was empty. Kendra found Lena out on the porch, balancing atop a stool. Lena was hanging wind chimes. She already hung several along the length of the porch. A butterfly flitted around one of the one of the chimes, playing a sweet, simple melody. A butterfly. Why why a butterfly, not a fairy? What's the difference there? Hmm. Good morning, Lena said. You're up early. I'm still so excited from yesterday. Kendra looked out at the garden. The butterflies, bumblebees, hummy and hummingbirds were already going about their business. Grandpa was right. Many clustered around the newly refilled bird baths and fountains, admiring their reflections. Just a bunch of bugs again, huh? Lena said. Can I have some hot chocolate? Let me hang this last wind chime, or these last chimes, she said, moving the stool and climbing fearlessly on top of it. She was so old. If she fell, she would probably die. Be careful, Kendra said. Lena waved a dismissive hand. The day I'm too old to climb on a stool will be the, the day I'm too old to climb on a stool will be the day I throw myself off the roof. She hung a final chime. We had to take these down for you kids. Might have made you suspicious to see hummingbirds playing music. Kendra followed Lena back into the house. Years ago, there used to be a church with an earshot that would play melodies on the bells, Lena said. It was so funny to watch the fairies imitate the music. They still play those old songs sometimes. Lena opened the refrigerator, uh, removing an old-fashioned milk bottle. Kendra sat at the table, and Lena poured some milk into the pot on the stove and began adding ingredients. Kendra noticed that she was not just scooping in chocolate powder. She was stirring in contents from multiple containers. Grandpa said to ask you about the story of the guy who built the boathouse, Kendra said. Lena paused in her stirring. Did he? I suppose I am more familiar with the story than most. She resumed stirring. What did he tell you? He said that the guy had an obsession with naiads. What is a naiad, naiad anyhow? It's a water nymph. What else did he say? Just that you know the story. The man was named Peyton Burgess, Lena said. He became caretaker of this property in 1878, inheriting the position from his maternal grandmother. He was a young man at the time, quite good looking, wore a mustache. There are pictures upstairs. The pond was his favorite place on the property. Mine too, said Kendra. He would go and gaze at the naiads for hours. They would try to tease him down into the water's edge, as was their custom, in order to try to drown him. He would draw near sometimes even pretending he meant to jump in, but always stayed tantalizingly out of reach. Lena sampled the hot chocolate and stirred some more. Unlike most of the visitors who seemed to regard the naiads as interchangeable, he paid special attention to a particular nymph, asking her for her by name. He began to pay little heed to the other naiads. On the days when his favorite would not show herself, he would leave early. Lena poured the milk into a pot, from the pot into a pair of mugs. He became fixated on her. When he built the boathouse, the nymphs wondered what he could be doing. They, uh, he constructed a broad, sturdy rowboat so he could go out to the water and be closer to the object of his fascination. Lena brought the mugs to the table and sat down. The naiads tried to be upset, tried to upset the, his craft. 
The naiads tried to upset his craft every time he set forth, but it was too cleverly constructed. They succeeded only in pushing it around the pond. Kendra took a sip. The hot chocolate was perfection, barely cool enough to sip comfortably. Peyton began trying to coax his favorite naiad to leave the water, to come walk with him on land. She responded by urging him to join her in the pond, for to leave the water would mean to enter mortality. The tug of war went on for more than three years. He would serenade her on his violin and read her poetry and make her promises about the joys their life together would hold. He showed such sincerity and such per perseverance that on occasion she would gaze up into his kind eyes and falter. Lena sipped the hot chocolate. One day in March, Peyton got careless. He leaned too close to the, gu uh, the gunwale and the naiad, a naiad, caught hold of his sleeve and he convert uh, conversed with his fate. Okay, let me try that again. He leaned too close to the gunwale, and a naiad caught hold of his sleeve as he conversed with his favorite naiad. A strong man, he resisted her, but the struggle pulled him to one side of the boat, upsetting his t typical equilibrium. A pair of naiads heaved upward on the other side, and it capsized. He died? Kendra was horrified. He would have died, yes. The naiads had their prize. In their domain, he was no match for them. Giddy with long-awaited victory, they rushed him toward the bottom of the pond to add him to their collection of mortal victims. But it was more than his favorite could bear. She had grown fond of Peyton, seduced by his diligent attention, and unlike the others, she did not consider his death an amusement. She fought off her sisters and returned him to the shore. That was the day that I left the pond. Kendra spewed hot chocolate across the table. You're the naiad? I was, once. You became mortal? Lena absently blotted up the hot chocolate Kendra had sprayed, using a small towel. If I could go back, I would make the same decision every time. We had a joyful life. Peyton managed Fablehaven for 51 years before passing it off to a nephew. He lived 12 years after that and died at 91. His mind was sharp until the end. Helps to have a young wife. How are you still alive? Kendra asked. I became subject to the laws of mortality, but they have taken effect gradually. <clears throat> As I sat by his deathbed, I looked perhaps 20 years older than I had on the day when I had carried him from the water. I felt guilty about looking so young as his frail body was shutting down. I wanted to be old like him. Of course, now that my age is finally catching up with me, I don't care for it much. Kendra sipped more of her hot chocolate. She was so enthralled that she barely tasted it. What did you do after he passed away? I took advantage of my mortality. I had paid a steep price for it, so I traveled the world to see what it had to offer. Europe, the Middle East, India, Japan, South America, Africa, Australia, the Pacific Islands. I had many adventures. I set some swimming records in Britain and could have set more except I was holding back. No sense in raising a lot of questions. I worked as a painter, a chef, a geisha, a trapeze artist, a nurse. Many men pursued me, but I never loved again. Eventually, there was the sameness to the traveling, so I returned home to the place that my heart never left. Do you ever go back to the pond? Only in memory. It would be unwise. They despise me there, all the more intensely because of their secret envy. How they would laugh at my appearance. They have not aged a day, but I have experienced many things that they will never know. Some painful, some wonderful. Kendra finished the last of her hot chocolate and wiped her lips. What was it like being a naiad? <clears throat> Lena gazed out the window. It's hard to say. I ask myself the same question. It wasn't just my body that became mortal. My mind transformed as well. I think I prefer this life, but it might be because I have changed fundamentally. Mortality is a totally different state of being. You become more aware of time. I was absolutely content as a naiad. I lived in an unchanging state for what must have been many millennia, never thinking of the future or the past, always looking for amusement and always finding it. Almost no self-awareness. It feels like a blur now. No, like a blink. A single moment that lasted thousands of years. You would have lived forever, Kendra exclaimed. We weren't quite immortal. We do not age, but I suppose some of our kind could endure forever. If lakes and rivers last forever, it's difficult to say. We did not really live, not like mortals. We dreamed. Wow. At least that was the way of things until Peyton, Lena said, more to herself. I began looking forward to his visits and back on them in memory. I suppose that was the beginning of the end. Kendra shook her head, and I thought you were just a half-Chinese housekeeper. She smiled. Peyton always liked my eyes. She batted them. He said he was of the Asian, Asian persuasion. What's Dale's story? Is he a pirate king or something? Dale is a regular man. 
a second cousin of your grandfather, just a man he trusts. Kendra looked into her empty mug. A ring of chocolate sediment circled the bottom. I have a question, and I want you to answer honestly, she said. If I can. Is my grandma Sorensen dead? Well, what makes you ask that? I think Grandpa makes up phony excuses for her not being around. This is a dangerous place. He's lied about other things. I get the feeling he's trying to protect us from the truth. I often wonder if lies are ever a protection. She's dead, isn't she? No, she's alive. Is she the witch? Remember Muriel Taggart out in the woods? She's not the witch. Is she really visiting Aunt Whoever in Missouri? That is for your grandfather to tell. Seth looked over his shoulder. Besides the fairies fluttering about, the garden looked still. Grandpa and Dale were long gone. Lena was in the house dusting, and Kendra was off doing whatever boring things kept her occupied. He had his emergency kit in hand, along with a few strategic additions. Operation Sequel Monsters was about to begin. He hesitantly stepped off the edge of the lawn into the woods, half expecting werewolves to leap out at him. There were a few fairies up ahead, not as many as in the yard or in the garden. Otherwise, things looked pretty much the same. He marched forward, setting a brisk pace. Where do you think you're going? Seth whirled around. Kendra was approaching from the garden. He walked back to meet her at the edge of the lawn. I wanted to see what's really at the pond, those Naya thingies and stuff. How brain damaged are you? Didn't you hear a word that Grandpa told us yesterday? I'm gonna be careful. I won't go near the water. You could get killed. I mean really killed, not bitten by a tick. Grandpa made these rules for a reason. Adults always underestimate kids, Seth said. They get all protective because they think we're babies. Think about it. Mom used to complain all the time about me playing in the street, but I always did it. And what happened? Nothing. I paid attention. I stayed out of the way when a car came. This is so different. Grandpa goes all over the place. Kendra clenched her hands into fists. Grandpa knows the places to avoid. You don't even know what you're dealing with. Besides, when Grandpa finds out, you'll be stuck in the attic for the rest of your say stay. How's he gonna find out? He knew we went into the woods last time. He knew that we drank the milk. Because you were there. Your bad luck rubbed off on me. How did you know where I was going? Your secret agent skills need some work, Kendra said. A good start might be not wearing your camouflage shirt every time you go exploring. I might need it to hide from dragons. Right, you're practically invisible, just a floating head. I have my emergency kit. If anything attacks, I can scare it away with my gear. With rubber bands, Kendra said. I have a whistle, I have a mirror, I have a cigarette lighter, I have firecrackers, they'll think I'm a wizard. Do you really believe that? And I have this. He pulled out the little skull in the crystal globe from Grandpa's desk. That should make them think twice. A skull the size of a peanut? They're prob uh, there probably aren't even any monsters, Seth said. What makes you think Grandpa's telling the truth this time? I don't know, maybe the fairies? Well, good job, you blew it. Congratulate yourself, I can't go now. I'm going to blow it every time. Not to be a jerk, but because you could really get hurt. Seth kicked a stone, sending it skidding into the woods. What am I supposed to do now? How about exploring the enormous garden full of fairies? I already did. I can't catch them. Not to catch them, to look at magical creatures that nobody else even knows exist. Come on. He reluctantly joined her. Oh, look, another fairy, he mumbled. Now I've seen a million. Don't forget to put the skull back, she said. When they responded to the call for dinner, a stranger sat at the table along with Grandpa and Dale. The stranger stood when they entered. He was taller than Grandpa and much broader, with curly brown hair. The layers of furry skins that he wore made him look like a mountain man. He was missing the bottom of one earlobe. Kids, this is Maddox Fisk, Grandpa said. Maddox, meet my grandchildren, Kendra and Seth. Kendra shook the man's calloused, thick-fingered hand. Do you work here too? Seth asked. Maddox is a fairy broker, Grandpa said. Among other things, Maddox added, call fairies my specialty. You sell fairies? Kendra asked, taking a seat. Trap them, buy them, trade them, sell them, all of the above. How do you trap them? Seth asked. A man has to keep his trade secrets private, Maddox said, taking a bite of the pork roast. Let me tell you, apprehending a fairy is no easy task. Slippery critters. The trick usually involves appealing to their vanity. Even then, it takes quite a bit of know-how. Could you use an apprentice? Seth inquired. Hold that thought for about six years. Maddox winked at Kendra. Who buys fairies? Kendra asked. Folks who run preserves like your granddad. A few private collectors. Other brokers. Are there lots of preserves? Seth asked. Dozens, Maddox replied. All over, or they're all on this, they're on all seven continents. Even Antarctica? Kendra asked. 
There's two in Antarctica, although one is underground. It's a harsh environment, but it's perfect for certain species. Ken just swallowed a bite of pork. What keeps people from discovering these sanctuaries? There's been a worldwide network of dedicated people keeping the preserves secret for thousands of years, Grandpa said. They are backed by ancient fortunes held in trust. Bribes get paid. Locations are changed when necessary. Helps that most folks are unable to see the little critters, Maddox said. With the right licenses, you can get butterflies through customs. When you can't, there's other ways to cross the border. The preserves are full of the preserves are the final refuge for many ancient and wonderful species, Grandpa said. The goal is to prevent these wondrous beings from passing out of existence. Amen, Maddox said. You have a good haul this season? Dale asked. As far as trapping goes, pickings are getting slimmer every year. I made a few exciting finds in the wild. One you won't believe. I picked up several rare specimens from preserves in Southeast Asia and Indonesia. I'm sure we can do some trading. I'll tell you more when we adjourn to the study. Kid, uh, you kids would be welcome to join us, Grandpa said. All oh, right, Seth cheered. Kendra took another bite of the succulent pork roast. Everything that Lena cooked was outstanding. Always perfectly seasoned, typically served with delicious gravies and sauces. Kendra never had any complaints about her mom's cooking, but Lena was an all-class, all of her own. Grandpa and Maddox discussed people Kendra did not know, other individuals involving the secretive world of fairy aficionados. She wondered if Maddox would ask about Grandma, but it never came up. Maddox repeatedly mentioned the evening star. Grandpa seemed to focus on this news with particular interest. Rumors that the evening star was forming again. A woman who claimed that the evening star tried to recruit her. Whispers of an attack by the evening star. This evening star has been mentioned a few times. Kendra could not resist interjecting. What's the evening star? It sounds like you're using it as a code word. Maddox glanced uncertainly at Grandpa. Grandpa gave him a nod. The Society of the Evening Star is an arcane organization that we all hoped had gone extinct decades ago, Maddox explained. Over the centuries, their relevance has waxed and waned. Seemed like just when you think they, you've seen the last of them, you start hearing rumors again. They are dedicated to overthrowing the preserves in order to use them for their own misguided purposes, Grandpa said. Members of the society consort with demons and practitioners of the black arts. Are they going to attack us? Seth asked. Not likely, Grandpa said. The preserves are protected by powerful magic, but I lend an ear to the news all the same. Rarely hurts to be cautious. Why the Evening Star, Kendra asked. Such a pretty name. The Evening Star ushers in the night, Maddox said. They considered the statement in silence. Maddox wiped his lips with a napkin. Sorry, not a very cheery topic around the dinner table. After supper, Lena cleared the table and they all went to the study. On the way there, Maddox collected several cases and crates from the entry hall. Dale, Seth, and Kendra helped. The cases had perforations, evidently to allow the creatures inside to breathe, but Kendra was unable to see into them. All were locked. Grandpa settled in behind his large desk. Dale and Maddox claimed the oversized armchairs, oversized armchairs. Lena leaned against the windowsill, and Kendra and Seth found seats on the floor. First off, Maddox said, bending over and unlocking a large black crate. We have some fairies from a preserve in Timor. He opened the hatch and eight fairies soared out. Two tiny ones, not even an inch tall, darted to the window. They were an amber in color with wings like flies. One banged the window pane with a minuscule fist. A large fairy, more than four inches tall, hovered in front of Kendra. She looked like a miniature Pacific Islander with the dragonfly wings across her back as well as tiny wings on her ankles. Three of the fairies had elaborate butterfly wings with the appearance of stained glass. Another had oily black wings. The last had furry wings and her body was coated in pale blue fuzz. Whoa, Seth said, that one's all hairy. It's a downy fountain sprite found only on the island of Roti, Maddox said. I like the little ones, Kendra said. A more common variety, they haunt the Malaysian peninsula, Maddox said. They're so fast, Kendra said. Why don't they escape? Catching a fairy renders her powerless, Maddox said. Keep her in a cage or a sealed room like this one, and her magic cannot be used to escape. While under confinement, they become fairly docile and obedient. Kendra frowned. How does Grandpa know they will stay in the garden if he buys them? Maddox winked at Grandpa. Gets right to the point, doesn't she? He turned back to Kendra. Fairies are highly territorial, non-migratory creatures. Put them in a livable environment and they stay put. Especially an environment like Fablehaven with gardens and plentiful food and other enchanted critters. 
I'm sure I can find a trade for the fountain sprite, Grandpa said. The band of sea sun wings are beautiful as well. We can work out the particulars later. Maddox slapped the side of the crate and the fairies returned. The ones with stained glass wings took their time, drifting lazily. The little ones zoomed in. The fountain sprite floated up to a high corner of the room. Maddox patted the, the side of the crate again and spat a stern command in a language that Kendra did not understand. The fuzzy fairy glided into the container. Next, we have some albino night grifters from uh, Borneo. Out of the case flew three milky white fairies, their moth-like wings peppered with black, flecks of black. Maddox proceeded to display several other groups of distinctive fairies. Then he began to show fairies at one at a time. Kendra found a couple of them disgusting. One had thorny wings and a tail. Another was reptilian, covered in scales. Maddox displayed it, its chamomile ability to... Oh, like camouflage. Chamomile ability to match different backgrounds. Now, for my big find, Maddox said, rubbing his hands together. I captured this little lady in an oasis deep in the Gobi Desert. I've only seen one other of her kind. Could we dim the lights? Dale jumped up and shut the lights off. What is she? Grandpa asked. An answer... Maddox opened the final case. Out soared a dazzling fairy with wings like shimmering veils of gold. Three gleaming feathers streamed beneath her, elegant ribbons of light. She hung gl uh, gloriously in the center of the room with a regal air. A gin harp? Grandpa said in an astonishment. Favor us with a song, I beg you, Maddox said. He repeated the solicitation in another language. The fairy gleamed even brighter, shedding sparks. The music that followed was mesmerizing. The voice made Kendra imagine a multitude of vibrating crystals. The wordless song had the power of an operatic uh, aria mingled with sweetness of a lullaby. It was longing, beckoning, hopeful, and heartbreaking. They all sat transfixed until the song ended. When it was over, Kendra wanted to applaud, but the moment felt too sacred. Truly, you are magnificent, Maddox said, repeating the compliment again in the foreign tongue. Chinese, maybe? He tapped the side of her case, and with a radiant flourish, the fairy was gone. The room felt dim and bleak in her absence. Kendra tried to blink away the splotchy after-images. How did you make such a find? Grandpa asked in wonder. I caught wind of some local legends near the Mongolian border. It cost me nearly two months of brutal living to track her down. The only other known Jin Harp has her own shrine in a Tibetan sanctuary, Grandpa explained. She was thought to be unique. Fairy connoisseurs travel from all corners of the globe to behold her. I can see why, Kendra said. What a singular treat, Maddox. Thank you for bringing her into our home. I'm touring her around the circuit before I take offers, Maddox said. I don't mean to pretend I can afford her, but send me word when she becomes available. Standing up, Grandpa looked at the clock and clapped his hands together. Looks like it's about time for everyone under the age of 30 to head off to bed. But it's still early, Seth said. No grousing. I have negotiations to conduct with Maddox tonight. We can't have young people underfoot. You'll need to stay in your room, no matter what commotion you hear downstairs. Our uh, negotiations can be a bit spirited. Understood? Yes, Kendra said. I want to negotiate, Seth said. Grandpa shook his head. It's dull business. You kids go have a good sleep. And no matter what you think you might hear, Maddox said as Kendra and Seth departed the study, we aren't having fun. All right, so that's the end of that chapter. Next one is called Prisoner in a Jar, which, uh, that's a good chapter. Um, so, chapter six, we don't have an activity today, just some questions. Um, we'll do an activity on the next one. So, Fable Haven, chapter six, questions. Um, a lot of this is just kind of based off the stories that we read. We know Lena told a story about her um, being a naiad and coming out and becoming mortal to be with the caretaker. Um, and how that affected her life. And then Maddox, fairy broker. That's pretty cool. So, number one, what is a naiad? Can you see that? Okay, cool. Number two, who was the caretaker of Fablehaven in 1878 who fell in love with a naiad? Number three, why did he need the rowboat? Number four, what would happen if a naiad left the water? Number five, who was that naiad? Which I just answered for you. Number six, what does Maddox Fisk do for work? Also just answered that. Number seven, how many magical preserves are there on Antarctica? Number eight, what did Maddox and Grandpa Sorensen discuss rumors of the uh, organization that's bad? That's kind of where I'm going with that. Next one, number nine, 
What is the mission of the Society of the Evening Star? <coughs> Hence number eight. <coughs> number ten. What renders fairies powerless? Number eleven. What was Maddox doing at the house? Number twelve. Why did Lena leave the pond? And number thirteen. On page ninety-two, Lena says, I often wonder if lies are ever a protection. So, do you think that lies can protect people from things? And then why or why not? So, that's the chapter for today. That was, what, chapter six? We'll do chapter seven next week, because this will go up on Friday. Hope you guys all have a good weekend. Bye.